This has been, I don't know, I've seen so many of you this week. This has been the most amazing week. I was saying earlier, um, I don't usually get nervous for these things, but I'm kind of nervous because I had to go out last night and walk all around Austin and rewrite my entire talk because I've learned so much this week. I've been to the disrupting the prison to pipe uh, the school to prison pipeline and stuff on trauma inf informed learning. I'm I'm just so excited. I'm flying out at 5:30 tomorrow morning so I can get home in time to teach tomorrow afternoon in New Hampshire. And uh, I'm just I'm gonna walk into my class and be like, <gasps> can we just get started? I'm so excited. I've learned so much. And they're gonna they're drug addicts and so they're gonna think I'm a complete idiot. Uh, they're gonna think I'm freaking out or something. Um, so thank you so much for letting me close this conference out for you. Um, I I wish I could go and be at every conference and then speak at the end because it's always a very different experience from the moment I walk into the door and learning all the stuff until the end. And so I'm just honored to be here. So what I get to do, I, I pinch myself all the time. What I get to do is I get to teach and I get to write about education and I get to go out to schools and I get to talk to kids and their parents and teachers and talk to them about how the way we parent and by extension I'd say teach kids actually affects their learning. I knew when I first started teaching that uh, the way we teach kids can affect their motivation. Of course, I've had really bad teachers and I've had really great teachers and I'm so much more motivated for the great teachers but I never understood why except for the fact that you know great teachers get you all happy and excited and and you know they love you no matter what and there's some sort of secret sauce crazy juju that teachers do that make you want to work so hard for them and I didn't know what that was so I've been teaching for about 20 years I actually never thought I would be a teacher I went to law school to study um, juvenile justice and I was asked to teach a class right before my last year of law school. And I'm going to take my glasses off because I can't see you lovely people. I'm one of the, my eyes are getting old and I can't read without them. Um, so I uh, went to law school to study juvenile justice and I was asked to teach a law class um, at Duke's TIP Talent Identification Program. And I got home from that first day of teaching and my husband took one look at me and he said, are you even going to finish law school? Because it was so obvious that I was sunk. That was it. I was a teacher. At the time, I was pregnant with my, um, my kid who's in college now. So it's been just about 20 years. And uh, at the time, when I first started teaching, I kind of thought that it was going to be me and the students and their parents and the learning. And we were going to walk off in the sunset together and braid each other's hair and talk about how great the learning is. And it's not really like that. Um, things got weird pretty quickly, actually. Um, <laughs> And I have stories, but so do you, so I'm not going to bore you with mine. The best one, though, the one that my students like the best, is the one where I hid from a mom in my boss's office, peeking through a door crack, and then actually, instead of walking past the mom so that I could go teach my Latin 6 class, I actually looked out the second story window to see how far the fall would be if I went out the window instead of past the mom who was mad at me and looking for me. So they like that story. They think that's great. <laughs> so anyway, things got weird pretty quickly, and that suspicion that there's some sort of magic juju in teaching that helps kids stay really motivated um, started to mix with the fact that there was something about the way my students were being parented that was somehow getting in the way of their interest in learning. And I wasn't sure what that was. I mean, I knew as a middle school teacher, and ugh, middle school is where it's at. <laughs> it's the best. I mean, I have so much respect for you people who teach the little, little ones, because I could never do that. You know, when you're subbing for your colleagues and they say, guess what, today you get to do first grade PE. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and I understand that sometimes you look at me and you say, I could never teach middle school. But as far as I'm concerned, it's where it's at. Because every single day, I get to go to school and watch kids screw up all day long. <laughs> and my job is to walk over to these kids and say, hi, sweetie, um, so today's the fifth day in a row that you've forgotten everything. So what's your plan for day six? What are we going to do on day six? Like, let's talk about how you're using your planner. What have you tried before? What are some things we could try that are new? I know you think my plans stink, but just hear me out for a second. And then right at that minute, here comes the parent with homework. 
and they're like, here it is, sweetie, I love you so much. And by the way, those teachers, they saw me coming in with that homework, and then now I am on it. And by the way, I think a few other parents saw me come in while I was doing that, and so they know I am on this parenting thing. <laughs> and then the kid just looks over and is like, well, that's my strategy. I mean, don't really need to come up with much else. And that was frustrating to me. And so what ended up happening was not only did I realize that something about the way we're parenting and teaching our kids that can undermine motivation, there's also something about our parenting and teaching that can undermine learning. And so that's really where I was when I started to write The Gift of Failure. Um, I came across an article that talked about um, autonomy, supportive parenting versus directive and controlling parenting and how that affects kids' motivation that really started this whole journey for me. It turns out that it is true that the way we parent and teach our kids affects not only their motivation, but their learning. I'm not gonna go very deep into the motivation part because Dan Pink, frankly, does a really good job of that. Um, right before I came on stage, I tweeted out a link to a bibliography that includes all of the books, all of the TED Talks, all of the, uh, the articles, all of the YouTube videos that, I'm, that I may or may not mention up here on stage. So if you want that bibliography, just click on that link. Dan Pink does a great job with, the, with his book Drive. And now the work that in Drive came from a book called, a lot of it anyway, came from the book called Why We Do What We Do, The Science of Self-Motivation um, by uh, Edward Deasy. And in that book, Edward Deasy talks about the research that, that shows how extrinsic motivators, motivators that come from outside of us, Latin teacher, ex, out, out of, in, intrinsic motivation, in, in, to, depending on the case you use with the word. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so extrinsic motivators undermine motivation. Not only do they undermine motivation, and I'm talking about long-term sustained motivation, they undermine long-term sustained motivation, they also undermine creativity. And at this point my head explodes because I'm like, well great, I am a teacher. What are the tools at my disposal? Extrinsic motivators, grades and points and scores, and we know how high kids will jump for one extra credit point. And it should be a creative endeavor. Learning should always be a creative endeavor. And so if the very things I'm doing as a teacher, let alone as a parent, are undermining my students and my kids' creativity and long-term focus and long-term dedication to learning, I'm sunk. What we need instead of extrinsic motivators and I'm not saying we can't ever use extrinsic motivators. In fact, extrinsic motivators work great in the short term, which is why they're such little liars, those extrinsic motivators, because they make us think we're, they're working, right? You pull out the sticker chart, you pull out class dojo, whatever that thing is that's giving you stuff to give the kid, because frankly, the kids know the stuff we're giving them for the learning in our minds is the valuable stuff, right? Because remember when I was young, Pizza Hut used to give out co pizza coupons for summer reading? And um, what's more valuable in that equation? Well, clearly it's the pizza, because otherwise we would be giving kids books for eating pizza. And they understand that. So when we hand them money for grades, or any other stuff for grades, we're telling them, look, here's this awesome, super duper stuff if you just bring me the letters at once. And they know that that stuff is really, really valuable, right? So, um, and by the way, when I go speak at schools, usually I get to speak to the, the students first. I always do this one little thing. At the very beginning, I say, okay, teachers and staff, close your eyes. You really have to close your eyes. And I ask the students to tell me, one, are you, it, raise your hand if you're getting paid for grades. And like, it depends on the school, but like 15 or 20% of the hands go up. Then I ask them to raise their hands if they're getting anything in exchange for grades, and like 20, 25% of the hands grow up, go up. Then I ask the teachers, I remind the teachers and staff to close their eyes, and I really truly mean it this time, and I ask the students to think really hard about this before they respond. Raise your hands if you really truly believe that your parents love you more when you bring home high grades than when you bring home low grades. I've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids, thousands of kids actually. And um, in middle school, about 80 to 85% of the hands go up. And in high school, 90 to 95% of the hands go up. So when we're giving them stuff for the response we want, like grades, 
whether that's love or money. And by the way, extrinsic motivators can also be these negative things, these things we perceive as negative over here. Like, for example, oh, you know, sweetie, you're, you're, you're grounded if you don't keep a B or better. Or let's see, what else could we do? Oh, or for example, if I were to log onto this computer and check your grades like 10, 20, 60, 90, heck, I'm just going to leave it on my desktop and hit refresh. <laughs> by the way, it freaks parents out when I tell them that we know from the administrative side how many times they log on, log on a day <laughs> and that we talk about them. Because those are extrinsic motivators too. The portal is an extrinsic motivator. It's called surveillance. And I'm not saying, again, that we shouldn't use these things. I'm just saying these are extrinsic motivators. Extrinsic motivators undermine long-term focus and they undermine creativity. So, what we want is intrinsic motivation. And if we can get it, and oh, it's so good when we can, when we can get it at its highest level, it's what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi Mihai calls flow. And you know what it looks like in your classrooms. It's usually when your kids are working independently, when they're making some choices about their learning, and you walk around, and the bell rings, and nobody moves. It's when you call the French teacher, and you're like, yeah, they're not coming because you don't want to mess with that. Because it turns out that intrinsic motivation or flow, this flow state, this elusive flow state, is where the best learning happens. And we can't get that. We can't get intrinsic motivation, let alone, let alone flow, unless we have three things. Number one, autonomy, which is kind of like independence, but a little bit different. It has to do with control over the details of things. Number two, competence which I usually am very sad to tell parents, not the same thing as confidence at all. <laughs> We're really good at the whole confidence game. Um, confidence is empty and confident, confidence is delicate and confidence is easily shattered, but competence, man, that's some durable stuff. And I'll come back to that in a second. And then where I'd like to spend most of my time is over here where the fun stuff is. And this has to do with connection. So autonomy, competence, connection. Let's start with autonomy. Okay, so there's this woman named Wendy Grolnick in Massachusetts and she does at Clark University and she does these really cool experiments to try to figure out how the way we parent our kids affects their motivation, affects their learning, affects their ability to move forward with a task. So she gives these tasks, these kids a really difficult task, but a task that's really engaging and exciting. And then she watches the parenting style of the parents who are there with them when they are asked to be there while their child completes this task. Some of the parents are there while their child completes the task. And maybe they're there you know, and, and sort of redirect if the kid gets frustrated or if the kid gets stuck. But for the most part, they let the kid have control of the, uh, of the, the task. And then there are those other parents, I'm sure we don't know any of them, and they're all over the kid in the task. And by the way, if when Wendy tells the parents that their child's work will be evaluated by other parents after the experiment, that behavior like goes through the roof. Because we're, frankly, our own worst enemy, each other's worst enemy. The second time she does the experiment, she separates the kids from the parents because this is what she wants to know. She wants to know how these children are going to react to a challenging task that is meant to be frustrating when their parents are not around. And it turns out that the kids who have autonomy supportive parents, who uh, support the kids' ability to make their own decisions about how to proceed with the task, those kids get excited and engaged and they push through because they get frustrated, but that's okay. They're able to take a breath and redirect and they finish the task. But the children of the, auto of the directive parents, I use the word controlling too, but I try not to use the word controlling very often because I piss parents off enough in the later parts of the talk that it's usually good for me to start with a nice word like directive. The kids of the directive parents, the kids who are constantly told, okay, now do this, now do this, now do this, those kids get engaged in the task, get excited about the task, get frustrated and almost all of them cry and give up. So if we have a group of autonomy supportive parents where their kids are able to get frustrated and complete the task, and then we have the kids of the directive parents who can't, can't handle being frustrated, it's just they don't have the emotional wherewithal to handle being frustrated, they can't complete the task. 
okay, well, that's frustrating enough when kids are toddlers and you know you have one of those kids who's like, oh, now tell me what to do, now tell me what to do, now tell me what to do. That's your problem when they're toddlers, but they're gonna come into our classrooms. And once they're in our classrooms, they, the kids that can't be frustrated cannot learn as well. It turns out that competence is this wonderful form of confidence. It's like confidence based on actual experiencing, doing stuff, trying stuff, trying to fix it, and then finding out what's wrong and then doing it differently. It's why the Stinky and Dirty Show is so much fun to work on because it's these two a, a dump truck and a digger, stinky and dirty, who have to solve a problem, but they think of it like preschoolers, and so they come up with crazy ideas for how to solve the problem that are never going to work, but they keep moving forward and taking the bits and pieces that work forward with them until they come up with a solution that works for everybody. And that's what kids who can get frustrated can do, because two of the most powerful teaching tools we have are desirable difficulties and formative assessments. Desirable difficulties um, are, are, both of these are articulated beautifully in a book that you should all read called Make It Stick. Came out of Harvard University Press a few years ago, blue book with a big star on the cover, gold star. Um, in that book, they talk about desirable difficulties and formative assessments and why they're so powerful. And why they're so powerful is this. Desirable difficulties what you do is you hand students something that's slightly challenging to parse, slightly challenging to get into the head, slightly challenging to digest. When you do that, your brain says, ooh, interesting, not just something I should stick into short-term memory like, oh, I don't know, the number for the pizza guy. That information we can just let dribble out later. That we don't need to keep around, but this stuff here, hmm, yeah. I'm going to encode that and stick it into long-term memory, the place where we'll hold on to, to hold on to information more durably, we'll know it for longer, we'll know it more deeply in the short term. It's a fantastic thing. But think about it. Desirable difficulties don't really work very well for kids who can't push through the difficulty part. When we hand kids stuff that is, oh, let, for example, if I were to teach Latin, sorry I'm, if I give anybody any flashbacks, there'll be medics in the back. Um, if I'm teaching the nominative and the accusative case and I give them a sentence like, puella puerum amat, the girl loves the boy, and it's all easy peasy and we sort of get familiar with that, and then I go over here and I say, ooh, how about this one? Puerum puella amat. And the kids are like, oh, that's different. I don't know what to do with that. And I say, no, 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 you can do that. Just be quiet for a minute. In my Latin class, no one's allowed to speak for a couple of seconds um, after something is presented because you, know, you want to make sure that all of the kids have a chance to answer the question, not just the kids who throw their hands up in the air in the first moment and aren't thinking as hard practically when they're throwing their hand up in the air. And then they realize, oh, oh. That was super sneaky of you, Mrs. Leahy. You just moved those two words around. And I say, excellent. Now, now you're going to work on, by yourselves on this other one out here. I'm going to push them out either with homework or with whatever. And by the way, I don't have time to talk about homework. I don't have time to talk about all the other flawed things we are doing in education, the way we grade kids, the way we assess kids, the way we give kids too much homework, all that stuff I don't have time for. I've written it ex about it ex extensively. And, uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, The Gift of Failure sort of had to be this book that was written around the, inside the framework we have that exists now. So that's sort of where I'm trying to move from. Um, when we send kids out with group work or homework or whatever that's slightly more difficult than they've done in the past, slightly pushes them beyond their ability level, slightly pushes them into new dimensions of understanding, the only kids who can really handle that are going to be the ones who can get frustrated, take a breath, reread the instructions, and try it again. Kids who freak out the moment they get frustrated and are like, I can't do this, I can't do it, or throw their hand up in the air and say, Ms. Lee, Ms. Lee, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Those kids aren't going to be able to push through with the desirable difficulties. So they are simply less teachable in my room. And when I tell parents this, I say, look, all these things that you're doing to try to make your child's life easier. I know how hard it is to see kids frustrated. As a teacher, I know the answer. I, don't, I would love to go in and swoop in and, and, and be the bomb for their souls and give them the answer to that question because it's so hard and 
I know it's hard, and I know you're having a crisis of confidence, but I can't because that, that would make me a terrible teacher. Giving kids answers isn't good teaching. Helping them find answers, that's good teaching. So one of the other issues that I want to talk about a little bit is we have desirable difficulties over here. And again, the word desirable is there for a reason. It's not like we can hand kindergartners calculus and be like, they're going to know it really well because that's really difficult. Desirable difficulties ask kids to do something that's just beyond their ability level, to stick with it a little longer and push themselves a little bit harder. The other incredible tool we have is formative assessments. One of the other things that I was seeing in my students is that they really weren't able to handle feedback. It freaked them out, right? So, and as a writing teacher, especially in my classroom now, I teach kids, um, I teach in an inpatient drug and alcohol rehab where a lot of the kids have, um, they've got serious learning issues and they've learned that they're not very good at stuff and they shouldn't really even try. And one of the things that kids need to be able to do is to hear constructive feedback. And often what I was seeing was that like deer in the headlights disassociation, like you, when you're doing a criticism or feedback sandwich, you know, you give them all the good stuff. You say, sweetie, this is coming along so well. You look where, you, how much progress you've made now. And then right when you say the now, because they know that's the signal for here comes the bad part, they go away in their head over there and they don't hear the feedback. Well, formative assessment or assessment that shapes learning, assessment that we do sort of every day to gauge where all of our students are all the time and it forms their learning and it forms our teaching. That's the best part about a formative assessment is we have to realize, oh, I thought I kicked it yesterday. I went home feeling good about that lesson and now nobody knows what I'm talking about. Well, that's formative for me. I'm gonna have to step back and reteach that. I didn't do a very good job yesterday. It's not because they're stupid. It's not because they weren't paying attention. I need to do better for them. And it's also formative for them. One of the really heartening things I've seen this entire conference, every single session, someone's talked about metacognition and I'm like, yeah. It's so exciting because one of the things that formative assessment does is it helps build that metacognition muscle. Kids have to be able to hear what they do and don't know because as humans, we're terrible at metacognition. You know, when that kid comes into class and he's like, I know this math, I'm going to kill this test. And then they get the test back and they have a C and they realize, oh, I didn't know what I had no idea, but if they had been doing, if you, as teachers, had been doing formative assessments along the way, they would know what they do and don't know. I was speaking just recently at a school where the students were livid with this one teacher. I asked to meet with some students with no staff or teachers there, and the kids were great. They were so interested in their learning. They were so invested in their learning and they loved their school and they loved learning. But one of the things was really that made them really angry was this one teacher had given them a unit test. It was like, you know, they, they, he taught for a month and then he gave a big gigantic summative assessment at the end. And there was no going back. There was no changing answers. There was no having a discussion about retakes. Um, it was just, hello, here you are, here's what you do and don't know, sorry, no time to go back. I'm moving on to unit two. And they just felt like they weren't learning very well. And I, um, I talked not about this specific teacher, but about what the student said, um, although the teacher did email me later and he knew I was talking about him and he does not like me very much. Um, <laughs> the students were really feeling betrayed because they felt like, you know, what they really wanted was a teacher who cared about their learning. Yesterday, I was at the Chalkbeat um, Amer Great American Teaching Teach-Off, and they had a, a kid there, a fourth grader, his name was Rory, and they asked him, what do you love most in a good teacher? And Rory said, I love a teacher that cares about our learning. That's what kids want. And when we're giving them feedback that's helping them learn, when we're willing to say, huh, those big summative tests don't really work, I need to do better for my students and maybe give them some formative assessments instead and explain to the students why, that shows that you care about your learning. And here's the key part. Whenever I talk to parents and they ask me about um, how to help their kids, oh, this one woman one time said, my children do not read for fun. So I would love it if you would give me a list of really challenging books that they're gonna wanna read for fun. 
I said, well, when you find that magic list, if you could share that with me. I said, but let's start here. I said, um, do they see you read for fun? And she said, well, I I'm really busy. And I said, okay, well, I don't know what I can tell you because unless you're modeling that behavior for them, um, I can't really give you some magic wand. And I said, okay, but let's start with, let's work on this list. What do your kids like to read? And she said, well, they like those Diary of a Wimpy Kid books, but those are stupid, so I threw them away. <laughs> I happened to know this mom had some money, and so I gave her an assignment and said that the very first thing that she needed to do was go out and get those books and apologize to her child. And I discussed with her sort of the right ratio of challenging books versus comforting books in a, in a literacy program that she could start at her own home, starting with Dyer of a Wimpy Kid. <laughs> so formative assessment is so important because it gives us the ability to model for our students not only that we will adjust our teaching based on their learning, but that we're willing to take feedback and admit it when we drop the ball and when we stink at something or when we fail at something. Let me show you how I handle it when I am not the best teacher I can be and I can apologize and I can move forward and do better next time. Because I, my, my book is called The Gift of Failure not because I want kids to fail, that's the last thing I want. I have two of my own kids. I've been teaching for 20 years. I don't want these kids to fail. What I do want, though, is when they do fail, because they're going to, I want them to respond in a, a positive way to that failure. I want them to have what Tim Harford in his book Adapt calls a positive adaptive response to failure. I want them to move forward knowing that they can, they can do that and they can have a better experience once they've become more competent. And I want them to see that in me too. Okay, autonomy, competence, connection. I told you this is gonna be my favorite part because for parents, it's a really simple equation. In order to have intrinsic motivation in your kids, you need autonomy to give them autonomy. You need to help them feel competent, not just confident. And by the way, I do a really thorough explainer of Carol Dweck to parents, and I beg them that if they haven't read Carol Dweck's mindset to please read it and not just articles about it, because it's a little more complicated than, yeah. Well, because it's so dumb, because they think, okay, if you, see, here's how education journalism works. I go to my editor and I say, hi, I would like to write about this complicated piece of, ed, of educational theory, and I'm going to need, like, at least 1,500 words for that, because it's really important. This is going to change lives. And she's like, great, except you can have 500 words for that. And then what I end up with, or what people end up with, is the understanding that Carol Dweck's mindset means that we should always praise kids for effort and never praise them for being smart, which is so stupid. Because if I was to run at that door in the back of the room and I don't know I need to push the bar to unlatch the door, and yet I keep running at the door and you keep saying, oh Jess, nice effort, you're doing so well. I'm going to be black and blue. I am not going to trust you anymore. And you are terrible teachers. We have to support, <laughs> seriously, we have to support kids' effort, yes, of course we do. But what we do is we need to be autonomy supportive. We need to support their efforts to learn and be there and push them in the direction that they need to go ever so slightly, even if it just means we blow them in that direction in a subtle way so that they can get where they need to go and say, hmm, stop, don't run at that door again. Look at the door. Take a breath. Is there any aspect of that door that maybe you've missed? And then if they're my kid, I say, sweetie, you know what? I could see that that was really a frustrating experience for you, and I'm really proud of you because you stuck with it, even though it was hard for you. That's what she means by praise for effort. She doesn't mean that we just praise kids for effort. So, sorry, tangent, back to, back to connection. Because this is where the real good stuff is. With parents, it's a really simple thing. It's number one, love the kid you have, not the kid you wish you had. And number two, do not just love your kid based on their performance. And of course, they say, well, I would never. And I'm like, yeah, I would never either, except when your kid comes home from school and they're all wiggly and they're like, I'm so excited and they give you, they show you a test and they're like, look, 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 look at what I got. And it's an A. 
and you want to put it on Instagram and on the refrigerator and FaceTime with grandma and put it on the Twitter. The, the Twitter. I love Twitter. I have never called it the Twitter ever in my entire life. I don't know why I just said that. Um, they know that they have just pleased us in a wonderful way, right? And then they come home sullen and quiet and they say, and they show you the F. I'm sorry, I mean B minus, because B minus is the new F, right? Right. Okay. They show you the B minus. And you're silent. Again, that silence is withdrawal of love based on performance. And it's one of the most emotionally damaging things we can do to our children. There's a wonderful book called Duct Tape Parenting by Vicki Hofla. And in that book, she talks about the fact that what you can do if you are focused on the process of learning rather than the end product, you can talk about those two tests in a way that really, it doesn't make them equal. They're not equal. You don't have to pretend that you're emotionally feeling the same about an A as you are about a B minus slash F, but you can at least nod to the fact that what you really care about is the learning. Because let's remind you back here, remember when I told you about the 80 to 85 percent in middle school and that 90 to 95 percent in high school that really feel like their parents love them more based on their performance? That's where our kids are. And so if we can love the kid we have, not the kid we wish we had, and we can love our kids not based on their performance, we'll be going a really great distance for them. But for teachers, it is this, and I tell parents this, when I'm speaking to parents, I say, look, if your kid's teacher makes your kid excited about learning and makes your kid feel like the stuff he's learning here in this classroom can go out there in the world. If the kid comes home from school and says, you know what, I heard there was this, this earthquake in Peru and we looked at pictures of the bridges that stood and the bridges that fell and you know what, if you put arches in a bridge, it might stand better during an earthquake and if you use, I don't know, rectangles, it might fall down and I, I could build those bridges someday and save people from falling into a river during an earthquake. That's what I learned today. That's called self-efficacy. That's called agency. That's called feeling like I can change the world. And that's what great teachers do. And the way we do that is twofold. And it all comes down to connection. It comes down to connecting with our students on an interpersonal level, which does not mean we have to adopt them, which does not mean we have to give them our home phone numbers, which does not mean that we have to give them, you know, these parts of ourselves that we need to hold back. I just, I just got to write this piece for the Washington Post um, in the wake of the recent school shooting. I, I wrote about the fact that I, I have nightmares about my students. It's just the nature of being a teacher, right? Um, the nightmares I have are about where I'm gonna stuff them when the shooter comes to my school. And we don't have, I taught in a trailer for a long time. We don't have a closet. Um, I had the ground under the trailer. So in my dream, I would dig a trench and I would put the children in the trench and I would put the dirt on top of it. There's no lack of connection that we feel for our students. But when we have authentic connections with our students, it makes a difference in their learning. Here's what's so cool about this. I work at this rehab, and yes, I know I'm running over. They said I could, because I'm the last one. <laughs> um, they, uh, when I, uh, <laughs> sorry, when I started teaching at the rehab, I was told very clearly that I'm not allowed to tell my students anything personal about me, and I'm not allowed to ask anything personal about them. And I said, hello, have you ever met a writing teacher before? because they're gonna tell me all of it. But I was worried about making sure that I didn't break that rule at first for like two or three days. And, um, and I found out about a study that came out of um, Harvard's Graduate School of Education showing that we don't have to tell them really personal stuff. They went into a school, this one guy, Hunter Gelbach, went into a school and he gave everyone a survey, a survey asking about really simple things. What's your favorite color? Who's your favorite sports team? Sorry, I know for some of you that's not a little thing. Um, and then they showed the kids and the teachers the answers and they said, look, you have a lot in common with Mr. So-and-so. And Mr. So-and-so, look, you have a lot in common with your student. In that school that was a highly diverse school with a big, big um, achievement gap, they narrowed the achievement gap in that school by 65% that year. 
and teachers reported that they spent more time with their students outside of class. Now that's one school, one experiment. Hunter's in the middle of trying to recreate that experiment on a larger scale. Um, but that was really important to me to hear that it doesn't have to be a highly personal connection that I'm going to get in trouble for outside of school hours. It can be just a really simple, I see you. Or, you know what, I overheard this morning that your guinea pig squeaky died. And if you need to put your head on your desk or you need to take a time out, you can do that. That's seeing them, that's hearing them, that's knowing them, and they want to be known, especially kids at risk. These are the kids I deal with now, and knowing them, coming through for them, being a person that really sees them is really important. I wanna close with a, a really, uh, well, I want to make sure you understand that connecting with your students doesn't necessarily have to be a, a personal connection either, by the way. It can be an academic connection. When uh, there's a wonderful researcher, Mary Helen Imordino Yang, and her research shows really, really clearly that education and that learning is emotional, that we don't learn very well about stuff that we don't care about, duh. I'm not going to learn the rules of NASCAR. I'm sorry, I don't care. But when I found out that NASCAR emerged out of um, running, uh, during Prohibition, running alcohol from place to place, there was like a flicker of interest. <laughs> I might learn that stuff. When she puts kids in fMRI tubes and looks at their brains while they're learning about stuff they care about versus stuff they don't care about, surprise, surprise, when you're learning about stuff you don't care about, your brain just goes dark. Your learning centers don't light up. And that's where relevance comes in. Relevance is just taking this stuff that, sure, you may not care about here, but let me show you how it's relevant to not just to your life, but to the world. And if that's difficult, go online, because there are online educators that are doing a fantastic job of that. You can watch Emily Grassley at the Brain Scoop. Her job at um, the Field Museum of, of Natural History is Chief Curiosity Correspondent. That is a job I want. Um, you can watch Vsauce. You can watch Michael Stevens' new show, Mind Fields. You can watch Vi Heart, for God's sake. The woman is a miracle because my child was told by his teacher that he's not allowed to doodle in class because it's distracting. I'm the education writer mom, so like there are only so many battles I can fight, and so that was just, I had to pick my battles with that one. So we watch by heart instead, and we watch my favorite episode, which is the one where she takes three whole episodes to explain how the Fibonacci sequence governs the growth of plants, using her hand and a Sharpie and a notebook, and she doodles her way through the whole thing, and it's amazing. Making these connections, interpersonal connections and relevance connections for our kids is how we get them really interested in the learning and how we build intrinsic motivation. So I'll get to that last story. The last story I have for you is I was teaching some kids recently, my, my rehab kids, and I asked them to write two paragraphs for me. One is a paragraph about how you see yourself, and the other is a paragraph about how other people see you. Other people see you. And this student was willing to write the one about the way he sees himself, but not the one about how other people see him. And I said, why? And he said, well, because, well, it took a long time, actually, to get this out of him. But he, um, he was afraid to write that paragraph because he said the answer, it's really simple. It's one sentence. All the men in my family go to prison, and that's what's going to happen to me. About a week later, I asked them to write a paragraph. <laughs> I have to say the word paragraph when I mean page because page scares them, but paragraph doesn't. So I asked them to write a paragraph about a teacher that has had some impact on his life. Someone at school, actually, that's had some impact on his life. And he said, I can't write that. And I said, why not? And he said, because there isn't anyone. I said, you're 17 years old, and there isn't one person at your school that's ever had an impact on your life. And he said, a good impact? I said, yeah, a good impact. And he said, oh, no, wait, I have one. And I said, great. And he got to work. And he wrote a page and a half about this one guy. And it turns out this guy was the guy who staffs the rubber room where they send the kids who are so bad that they can't be in class anymore. And it's like a holding room for the kids. And please don't get me started on that. 
but it was this room where they send the bad kids and there was a guy working there and it turns out the guy that was working there wasn't even a teacher because they were having a staffing shortage. He was a groundskeeper and he sat there in that room and babysat. But what he did also was listen. And this kid wrote that the man in this room was the only person who would care about him if he didn't go back to school after rehab. And the reason he thought he might try to finish high school. And he did, because of a groundskeeper who saw him and would miss him if he wasn't there. You can't even begin to underestimate the impact you have on kids. When we give them some autonomy and help them see that they have the power to make decisions about themselves and the world and the details of their world, when you help them feel competent and not just confident, when you help them feel like they can do stuff and screw it up and that's okay because I can do it over here better next time. And when you let them know that you really truly see them and that you would miss them if they weren't there, that's what makes us great teachers. Thank you very, very much.